I remember when I first saw the Indiana Jones movie, uh, I thought it was uh, disgusting in a lot of ways, but what it did bring to me and I think to the, the community at large was the fact that uh, there is a mystery to discovery and people like to discover things. Uh, I can remember uh, working at Flower Dew 100 many, many years ago, discovering a, uh, a King's Touch token of all things. And here was a, 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 an artifact that uh, was, was made you know, several hundred years ago, uh, was issued by a king in England, and it was to cure the, uh, the masses of sickness by, by the king's touch. And I'm thinking as I discovered this, you know, wh what an exciting thing to, to find in the ground. How exciting this must be for not only me, but for the general public. And I think that's what we've tried to do with the uh, professional community and the archaeological community is to harness this thrill of discovery in a way that it helps us to understand the past. And one of the leaders of our merry band of organizations have all teamed up together with York County and the Fairfield Foundation and the Middle Peninsula chapter of the Archaeological Society of Virginia. It's literally an encyclopedia of different organizations that have all teamed up on this. Um, but Joe's going to give a, a, a quick rundown. Um, well, I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you for coming out today. Well, I'm Joe Burkhart, and I'm the president of the Tidewater Virginia Historical Society, which just began last year. This is uh, really Forrest Morgan, who isn't here yet, who is really, and Carl Fisher. Uh, from the Fairfield Foundation and Forrest also from the Fairfield Foundation conceived of this with uh, Dave and Thane Harpole. Dave Brown and Thane Harpole. I also want to publicly thank them for all the time they put into this and I have to tell you these guys are wonderful with the public. They really, not only are they great uh, uh, archaeologists but great with the public. Also I want to thank York County for letting us use this, this land. This is a wonderful use of public land I think. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this, and what an opportunity to work with guys like these. These are guys who have been honored by the state many times for their archaeological. the best archaeologists in the state. No, it's, uh, okay, so um, y'all are here to get your hands dirty and to learn a little bit about archaeology in the process. The Archaeological Society of Virginia is over 70 years old. And our primary goal is to promote the study of Virginia archaeology with there being over 15,000 years of Native Americans living in Virginia, and in addition to that, another 400 years where we have individuals of European and African ancestry. One of the big advantages of being a member is that you can participate in many of the activities that the society is involved in. Uh, we're an organization including both professional and avocational archaeologists, and we participate in archaeological surveys, excavations, and also lab work throughout the state. Today, we're participating in one such field opportunity. This is just one of the many, many different types of archaeological sites that are investigated across Virginia each year through the programs of the Archaeological Society of Virginia. So thanks for coming, enjoy your show, and hear from the master here, Dave Brown. So maybe this will be your entry to getting into the process of maybe looking at archaeology as something you want to volunteer to do more often. So why are we digging here today, you might ask? It's not about finding the stuff, it's about what the stuff might tell us and what that stuff tells us in context. So the other important thing is that as we're excavating, we're paying attention to where we find it and what we find it with, because that's how we build the stories. What we think is occurring in this area is essentially gonna be a combination of things. It's going to be part of the 18th century layers that Dave Hazard identified in the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, I can never, oh, 2006. It's nice to have a sign here. It tells us all about these things. Um, and that would be good because it tells us more about the main research questions we have for the site. Who was here? Why were they here? What was life like for them 
what does the material reflection tell us about the past? Um, secondly, it, it's giving us a bonus question, if you will, because it appears that there was an, a road cut through this area. And if we go with that hypothesis, we should be able to see it in the profile of the test unit that we excavate. You'll be able to see where the, basically the soil was cut through as the road developed over time. The key for us is trying to figure out what's an old road versus a new road. Because if the archeology span responds to the landscape on the surface, then we're looking at something that's 18th century. But if the archeology span doesn't respond to what you see on the surface, then we know that the two are not connected. What we're looking for are the details of the specific landscape that developed over that time. Well, I tell you what, this, this, is a, uh, this is an excellent site to start out on for archaeology. This is uh, it's a pretty good one. <laughs> can't, can't complain about this one at all. You're sort of collecting more puzzle pieces as you go. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a challenging puzzle to put together. But, uh, you know, whenever we can answer even the smallest questions, that's always a good thing. The great thing about public archaeology is we can bring the public in and they can do real archaeology and help us answer real research questions but have fun at the same time. You know, that's really what archaeology is. It's, it's learning and it's exciting. Trying to draw the line of, that I see of the contrast between soils to see if we can identify features in here. We think the whole thing might, actually, might be a feature. This layer with all the shell um, might be a dense you know, deposit of, of refuse. We took that down a couple inches and now I was trying to draw or score lines so we can map them to see the contrast with the soil. This has a lot of clay. This could be natural subsoil or it could be a, um, uh, just a fill layer with a lot of, just without a lot of artifacts. Um, but we have contrasting and mixed soils here and on this side. So this feature might actually go down in both directions or we could have two different things on either side. Um, it's hard to tell with a, with a two and a half foot square, but. You know, we have some very clear distinctions between soil colors and now we have to map them. And then the last thing we'll do is we actually need to draw a profile wall so we can tell the stratigraphy that we went through. And on this side, you can kind of see we have the first layer of topsoil, the second layer, which is a lot of brick and mortar. So a kind of architectural debris. And then we have about two or three inches of this uh, third layer that we dug, which is mostly dark soil with all oyster shell and animal bone and other things. So we have three very distinct layers and we're still not at the bottom. So this is a very rich and interesting site. So if you like today, uh, we'll have opportunities that are not just in this neck of the woods, but also across the Middle Peninsula on a variety of different types of sites, prehistoric sites, 19th century sites, plantations, wharves. Um, if you name it, uh, we can probably find a way to go ahead and find it. Uh, the public's interest in learning about these periods, these people, um, and the kind of research questions that we can ask is what drives us. Um, and finding really cool stuff along the way, um, whether it's archaeology in the sense of the soil stains in the ground, or it's the artifacts that we find, um, is just kind of icing on the cake. May I see that? Okay, this is a fantastic find because this is colony ware. Oh, that's colony slaves? Well, um, it's most frequently associated with being used by slaves. And even cooler, this piece has a flat rim. So it's a detail that's not just a pot. It's a pot with a particular, um, somebody made an additional attempt to have it look in a different, in a certain way. So colony ware is typically found on sites of the, of the late 17th through early 19th century um, associated with enslaved Africans. The debate persists whether or not enslaved Africans are exclusively making these, or if it's a combination of enslaved Africans and Virginia Indians. Some recent excavations at the Pamunkey Reservation have recovered some of the most fantastic colony fragments and bowls that we have ever seen. 
I mean, it's just amazing what they were able to recover. And that's a site that's historically associated and consistently associated with Pamunkey Indians. Um, it was a little... Come on, Mom, hurry! Hey guys, wow! Here you go. Thanks, Whoa! Oh, that's awesome. What do you think you have? So you have a, you have a pipe bowl. Yes, can you tell me what the, um, the significance of the color, the coloration? Well, most pipe bowls that we find are white and they're manufactured in Europe and then brought over and sold in towns and off of ships. This one's brown and it was manufactured here in the Chesapeake. So it's a reflection of the clay that they used, kind of like the subsoil that you see coming up in the feature below you. So it's interesting because it, it's something that people manufactured here in Virginia. Whether that's slaves, Indians, or poor people um, of any race. Essentially, finding something like this gives us more insight into their lives. More important, though, is if it's decorated. Do you want to take a look at that? Wow. This appear to have a little bit of decoration on there. It has little spots, um, punctate decoration is how we call it. Um, and also the size, it's relatively small compared to the ones we find in the 18th century. Hey Thane, do you want to take a look at this? Sure. What do you guys got? Pipe bowl. Oh, very cool. Um, I think they've got some decoration on the outside. Um, I Lisa, yeah, let's see if Thane can uh, figure out what that is. Yeah, it's definitely punctate. I'm trying to see what the uh, what shape the lines are. A lot of times you can get star shapes or running deer motifs. Um, this one definitely has parallel punctate lines, um, maybe forming almost like points of a star. But I'm not sure what the overall shape is. Uh, a lot of times these are filled with white clay to help them kind of pop out to make them a little more clear. But that often doesn't survive in the ground. That's very cool. Did you see that? Yeah, one, that's, I'm a little surprised about the uh, red clay pipe bowl here because most of the things we're finding are 18th century, and these tend to be more 17th century, leading up to the leading up to the turn of the 18th century. So that may suggest we have an earlier earlier component. Um, Does that match with the case bottle? Yeah, the case bottle, which that neck right there, that also tends to tends to be 17th century because um, around the 1660s, 1670s, they switched to more round wine bottles, and those uh, square case bottles tend to go out of fashion fairly quickly. So in combination, this is maybe suggesting an earlier component than we thought we had here. I'll let you see if you can get some of that around that bottle there. Yeah, you see that? Uh, that's called a case bottle. That's the top, the rim, and, and neck portion of a case bottle. Uh, and those are interesting because uh, case bottles were in fashion throughout most of the 17th century, and then in the 1660s, 1670s, they switched to round wine bottles. Um, and the round wine bottle shape quickly supplants the case bottles. Case bottles were square, they fit into wooden wooden cases, that's hence the name. Um, so that in combination with the pipe suggests that we may have an earlier component than we thought we had here. Um, you know, two artifacts by themselves aren't going to say it's definitely 17th century, but um, it's, it's kind of compelling. The other thing that, that this suggests, these large pieces, large fragments of, of objects along with the oyster shell, suggests we're actually in a feature. This may be uh, a trash filled pit or a cellar or something else where we have kind of primary deposition of material related to a household that was very close by. Um, and if it's a cellar, of course, it may have been the, the exact house that we're in and then it was filled in at the time it was, uh, went, out of, went out of use. So that's something very interesting. 
I mean, we know that this is associated in the 18th century with enslaved Africans, but if there is an earlier settlement to this location, um, we could be dealing with early settlers, 17th century mm -hmm. Europeans. We could be dealing with an early slave quarter, which is exceptionally rare in our neck of the woods. Um, for as much as Virginia has looked at its 18th century slave quarters and 19th century slave quarters, the 17th century ones um, are just not very common. Right. One we found, um, James River Institute found over at Kingsmill, mm -hmm. um, the Utopia Quarter gives us a lot of information and we found some at Fairfield uh, that seem to date to the early 18th century. But even though we have a tremendous number of enslaved Africans who have come into the colony at the end of the 17th century, we don't have a lot of the sites that they created, that they lived in, um, to give us a sense of what their life were like. Um, and with a situation like this, you know, maybe what we have here is three generations of slave right. quarters yeah. going from the late 17th century all the way through till the American Revolution. Yeah, because we are finding a few artifacts that actually date to the revolutionary time period or maybe even slightly after that. Um, so it seems like the majority of the, of the stuff here is, is first half of the 18th century, maybe to mid, but maybe we have a little bit on either side of that. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Would you expand oh, oh. this then? I think coming back each year is going to help us learn a lot more, but processing and learning about the artifacts each time is going to make it easier for us to make our excavations count. We won't just be digging to find things, we'll be digging to answer questions. And knowing that we've got time in between, the site's not threatened, we've got this beautiful park setting, we've got great people in the public who are willing to come and share their time with us. We can come back and now look at this and say, all right, let's look at the 17th century this time. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the late 18th century. Um, or let's look at uh, where the house was or where the right. trash was. Right. Um, and in each case, we can build more of an understanding for what these people's lives were like. And one of the remarkable things about this site, at least a portion of it seems to be unplowed, uh, doesn't have a lot of disturbances. And that's pretty clear in this unit here because uh, you, you know, we had a little topsoil and then we had that layer with mostly brick and mortar. And then beneath it, we have this, what appears to be intact feature fill uh, with all these other artifacts. So uh, it seems like there's very good evidence of a, of a destroyed building here. Uh, and the fact that we have multiple layers means that you could you know, dig anywhere in the vicinity and you're going to come right down onto 18th century or even earlier layers. Uh, you often don't get, that, don't get that chance when you have plowed sites. So uh, this is a very unique site. And we want to be very careful about how we choose to dig in, in certain locations. We want to be very specific uh, about trying to answer questions and take it slow. Come on, boy wonder. Go ahead and <laughs> take, take it on out. There you go. So no complete bottle. No, clean it <laughs> off. Just take your thumb. No. Look through the hole at the camera. <laughs> And for case bottles, the, the necks and the bases tend to be preserved the best because the sides are very thin glass. So that's, that tends to be what we find. The, the sides actually will sometimes decay in the ground and you don't even, you don't even find those thin, you know, flat Is pieces. Green? It's green, yeah, dark, dark green. If you hold it up, you might be able to see through it a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, several of us who founded this group work at Jamestown. We are archaeological interpreters. We explain the archaeology to the visitors from all over the country. And what we hear frequently is, I'd like to do that. <laughs> yeah, get down in the dirt. And the answer is, there is no opportunity around here. Certainly not at Jamestown and not at Williamsburg. So we said, you know, it would make sense if we provided an opportunity for the public to do archaeology. And that's what we're doing right here, as you see in the background invite people to come in and we teach them archaeology. Uh, we have this wonderful site out here which we think uh, is going to produce a lot of artifacts and really contribute to history while uh, getting the public exposed to and involved in doing archaeology. And I was here last fall, we did this uh, the first time, and I can tell you the look on people's faces when they pull out a, a piece from the ground that no one's seen in 300 years is a really a great experience. If you're interested in history, 
You also should be interested in how do you find out about history and archaeology is certainly one of those areas. So we put the Fairfield Foundation in contact with uh, the Tidewater Group and that's what brings us out here today uh, for those two organizations and the Fairfield doing the, during the, fi the field work, uh, supervising it, uh, puts the three, three groups back together that I sort of independently uh, went through over uh, a period of time of finding the groups and uh, finding uh, the enjoyment that I've had in, in archaeology. You know, you constantly get to get to meet people and watch their eyes be opened um, to this new way of finding information where they were just walking around on it the whole time. Um, and I even, even, I mean, I have the excitement myself, but I just love watching it in other people. I find archaeology very exciting. Um, Ever since as a, as a kid, I was fascinated with archaeology uh, from at least at least fourth grade, and I think um, I think I still have that that excitement. You know, whenever I go to a site, uh, it's just it's 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 knowing that that you don't know what's there. That's that's really the challenge. Like whether it's Fairfield where we've been working for 14 years, or New Quarter Park where we've only done two small excavations, or a site where we haven't we've just we're just visiting for the first time. You don't know what's there. And so that idea of um, we're going to be here, we're going to try to discover what's here, answer questions, that, that part's always exciting. Um, and of course the challenge is you, you come in with some questions, but you always end up with more once you start finding things. They, they just prompt more questions. And that's, that's what's always been exciting to me is you, you, just, you just prompting more questions every single time you, you come to a site. Uh, one of the greatest joys we have as archaeologists is to work with the public. Uh, every day we get the opportunity to learn from them and to have that as part of my job description uh, quite honestly makes me one of the luckiest people on the earth. We are a very active group, especially our Archaeological Society chapter. I characterize us as the best chapter in the state simply because we are archaeologists. We are not people who just get together once every three months and talk about things. We are out finding sites. We are writing history. We found North End Plantation. We found a significant 18th century site under a Confederate earthwork. Uh, we are locating other sites uh, all over Virginia and we are trying to uh, come up with the research designs and also uh, uh, to add, add that to the history. And that's part of what's important about this site. Uh, today, since this morning, we have, we have added that th there is a 17th century component to this site. Uh, up till 10 o'clock this morning, we thought we had exclusively an 18th century site. But in context, in, in, a, in a preserved strata, we found two definite 17th century artifacts, which is very exciting simply because that adds another complete layer to the history of this property. So now we know that under the 18th century context, there is a 17th century story to be told here also, which is very exciting since there's so little known and written about the 17th century in Virginia. Uh, so the artifact, the, uh, the, the pipe bowl we found is just, just an incredible artifact that is, should be on the cover of a Smithsonian. It is truly worth that. Um, but that, that's part of the reward and seeing the, the expressions on the, our volunteers' faces when they are participating and being part of something so significant as bringing those artifacts to light for the first time in 350 years. That is what it's all about. Uh, the catharsis happens, and I've seen it many, many times, not only in the, quite candidly, in the avocational community, but within the professional community. This catharsis where it's, suddenly it's not about the artifact. It's about the artifact as fossilized behavior. It's the artifact that that tells us about culture, that tells us about the past. And I think that's the excitement. It's not, you know, the projectile point that maybe is, you know, six point six inches long and is, you know, unbroken and very impressive. But it's reflecting on the hunter that used that. What was it used for? How was it used? When was it used? Uh, how did it interrelate between this, these, these people and, and their families and the region and the environment? And that's the excitement of archaeology. And I think that's where uh, I think that's where the mystery lies, and certainly for me, and hopefully we're sharing that view with the avocational community as well.